Um, welcome, Dr. Fahey. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I am probably most excited for you as a guest because this is a topic, um, most of what we're going to talk about today is are things that I've been particularly interested in, and I've actually been following your research for many years. So very excited and grateful that you're here today. Well, I'm, I'm humbled. I'm flattered. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward to talking. Sure. It was pretty cool when you directed me to your website for much of your publications. I recognized several of them, especially ones in regards to things related to gut health like H. pylori or polyphenols. So I'm excited to dive in today and would love if you could give just a quick um, introduction on yourself and um, kind of, you know, how you got into this field of research. Um, yeah, so I, I, I started off life as a, as a thinking I was going to be a musician um, and thinking maybe I'd be an aquaculturist growing oysters um, on the North Shore of Long Island where I, where I, well, I never grew, I haven't grown up yet, but where I started growing up. <laughs> Um, and things happened, various things happened. I went, I went to college and uh, studied natural, uh, natural sciences um, and uh, went to Johns Hopkins actually, thought I'd never come back, never go back there. Um, wound up getting a master's in algal physiology, studying microalgae. And when I got out of college or when I got my master's, there were no jobs available in that racket. Um, so I worked for a number of biotech companies for about 15 years um, and, and then um, was recruited by Paul Talalay at Johns Hopkins. Um, he actually, I don't think he was even aware that I had done a little work on broccoli at one of these biotech companies, but he and his um, uh, medical student uh, at the time, Yushin Zhang, had just discovered a compound called sulforaphane, and it's present in broccoli, and it got a lot of attention, a lot of media attention, and they were looking for someone to help them identify better sources of broccoli, and and so on and so forth. So I joined the group, quickly fell in love with what I was doing as opposed to what I'd been doing in the biotech companies, which was, you know, a lot of long-term promises that changing goals and so on and so forth. Um, and I realized they needed to get a, a doctorate to really be able to have any weight at all in that environment at Johns Hopkins Medical School. Um, and I did in human nutrition, got my could have graduate could have gone to graduation on the same day that my son graduated from college. I chose to go to his graduation, um, and uh, yeah, and for over a quarter of a century, I've been, I would say, primarily working on cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and their their compound their their main phytochemical compounds. But we've looked at phytochemicals very broadly. Um, looked at a lot of phytochemicals um, in a lot, a lot of plants, but this sounds sounds tacky, but sort of the money shot was always coming back to broccoli because there was not very much grant money. There was not very much funding whatsoever for most of the other phytochemical stuff that we were interested in. Huh. Um, so that's, and then I retired in June of 2020. Um, be in partly because of family reasons, of course, um, I wanted to be near grandchildren and my uh, our only son and his his wife and two grandkids, but but also because I thought it was time to take some of the very technical stuff that I had been uh, working on for you know forever and try to translate that more to. Uh, translated to a more lay audience or presented in ways that a lay audience could better understand. And I find I, I had found over the last decade or two that I really enjoyed teaching um, at the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, teaching really kids who were very bright and coming in not necessarily with much background in what I did. So that called for a certain level of, of sort of focus and then giving lectures to very diverse crowds 
that may or may not have included scientists, but often included a lot of nutritionists, healthcare professionals, people who weren't nerding out on the biochemical pathways like, like I and my colleagues do, but who were you know, keenly aware of nutrition and um, some of the problems. So you know, an audience like I think your listens, listeners are is exactly the kind of audience I, I enjoy talking to. Um, I wish we were in person so I could interact with them and you know take questions directly and that sort of thing. But that's one of the things we gave up with uh, with COVID, I guess, at I least for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I was in an in person event in Chicago and then spoke at the Boston Marathon two weeks ago, and that was the first time doing in person events again. And I, I've been super energized since. It really lit me up, and I, I just like you, love the interaction, but. Hopefully today we can still kind of, you know, a lot of these questions that, you know, we're going to be talking about are from clients of mine or, you know, people who follow me on social media. Um, so let's dive into what phytochemicals are and why they're important um, for gut health specifically, or just overall health and feel free to, you know, rope in any research that you would like to speak to. Yeah. So, um, I, and I, please stop me and interrupt me and ask questions if you think things need clarification. Um, so phytochemicals are a, a huge class of small molecules. There, there, there are very many of them, and they're typically very small compared to things like proteins and DNA and other biomolecules. Um, they're present at very low levels in plants also. Um, and the, however, they have oversized roles in defending the plants from predators. So um, they, they, repel, they repel various predators like fungi and bacteria and bugs in a very selective way. Um, they make, it, some of them make plants attractive to pollinators. Um, a, you know, a plant doesn't, a, a plant goes extinct if it doesn't get, if it's a flowering plant, if it doesn't get pollinated. Um, so there are ways to attract pollinators. Um, they help in photosynthesis. They make them tasty for dispersal or not tasty and offensive so that they don't get eaten. So, I mean, there are all sorts of, there are all sorts of cool ways that these phytochemicals act for the plant. And we human beings have, co-opted a lot of these compounds for our own health. Now, everybody's aware that there are toxic compounds in plants and some plants are poisonous to humans. True, all true. But, um, and, and I don't know the ratio of to toxic plants to uh, uh, beneficial plants, but I would, I would dare say that the number of, well, I wouldn't even guess. I mean, but, but the point is we have a ton of edible plants that we're all familiar with, many that we're not familiar with yet, but other cultures use them. Um, and these all are just loaded with phytochemicals. So when human beings consume plants with their phytochemicals, um, those phytochemicals are very much involved in the prevention of chronic disease. When you prevent chronic disease, you enable um, health span, you enable whatever lifespan you have, whatever term of life you get, uh, but you enable having that at higher function, right? Yeah. So if you're not, if you don't have two and three and four and five concurrent chronic diseases by the time you get uh, planted or uh, <laughs> whatever happens to you at the end of this journey, um, if you're lucky, you, uh, you just have a great ride, maybe lose a little vigor, and then one day don't wake up. And that's certainly my goal. Uh, and, and you know, I work towards that by trying to eat healthy and exercise and all of the things that a good blue zoner or a good Mediterranean diet are, are, are you know, from, familiar with. I think to go on a little bit about, about phytochemicals, they've been called the dark matter of nutrition. Mm. by by others uh, this name came about fairly recently and i'm not sure actually who coined it um but i certainly uh purloined it or or um i enjoy using it because i think 
it really sort of gives an idea of what we're talking about. You think of dark matter in the galaxies, you know, there are huge numbers of galaxies and stars. They're part of our universe. They're part of our being in so many ways that we don't understand yet. Um, yeah, we can see most of them, um, but we don't know how they function, you know, uh, completely. So calling, calling phytochemicals the dark matter of nutrition uh, connotes, as it should, that there are probably millions of them. The conservative estimates are 50,000, sort of a baseline. The, um, more, the estimates that I adhere to or believe uh, are a bit more accurate are upwards of a million, perhaps as many as 5 million. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I should take a breath and let you ask a question about it, but while I think of it, th there are problems studying that many compounds, right? I mean, yeah. it's just as if uh, you were an astronomer and said, I want to study, study all the stars. Well, you can't. Well, I want to, so I'm going to focus on that star, um, call it what you might. Same thing with phytochemicals. The same phytochemical may be present in many plants and conversely all plants have a whole bunch of phytochemicals and it's very difficult to get investigators to focus on a specific phytochemical because you know because you like it you want them to like it too well i mean this gets gets down to careers and it gets down to interests and so on but just because i think one phytochemical is best um, it doesn't mean there's going to be a lot of traction with other people studying it because people want to make their own careers. People want to make a mark. People want to discover something new. There are 5 million phytochemicals out there. Boy, I should be able to discover a new cool one or characterize it or talk about how, how effective it is. So it's difficult. And there's no rational public policy from the NIH or anywhere else sort of guiding that work. Um, so you have essentially a very broad swath of research looking at individual phytochemicals. Um, if you contrast that with the fiber, carbohydrate, protein, fat, even vitamins and minerals that are present in plants, all of which are not phytochemicals, um, you know, there are plenty of people who are focusing on carbs or focusing on fats, right? Or focusing on protein. They're pretty easy categories to get your research head around in, in, in one sense compared to phytochemicals. Let me take a breath. You must have a question, I hope. Yeah, no, that was amazing. And um, I think it's really interesting to kind of understand where the nuances are in terms of the research. And, you know, we were going to talk about the USDA dietary guidelines and, um, you know, kind of where the gap is there on lacking some recommendations of, of incorporating these phytochemicals. So, where are they found, um, you know, in food? So you mentioned obviously plant foods, um, and then in terms of the the benefits for gut health, um, acting as like prebiotics, their ability to modulate the microbiome. Do we like do we have a lot of information on what that looks like, or is this kind of fitting into your uh, dark galaxy concept where you know they're proposed to act like prebiotics, but we're not sure if it's just the fiber or what have you? Yeah, so um, you're right. There's not, there's not a lot of good information on, on them as prebiotics. I think, you know, I think that you probably know this a lot better than I do, but I, I think the definition of prebiotics really speaks to carbohydrates primarily, um, things like inulin. Um, which, which nourish from an energetic point of view, which nourish gut bacteria and, and gut microflora. And then that gut microflora churns out short chain fatty acids, for example, um, which then are absorbed by our guts. So um, <clears throat> we'd have to look up the definition of prebiotics. I used to teach it in a course, um, but it's been two years since I taught that course. So I forgot everything. Um, but I believe it speaks to carbs and things like, as I say, inulin, fructo oligosaccharides, and so on. Um, 
however, th there is there is certainly, I mean, the direct answer to the question I think you're asking, regardless of terminology, is yeah, phytochemicals clearly have an impact on your gut microflora. A, um, they they can change the comp. <clears throat> excuse me, they can change the composition of your microflora. Um, a, a small number of them that have been studied in that, um, in you know, in, in the human gut, have been shown to do that. Um, and on the other hand, um, the your bacteria in your microflora or your microflora does make changes to the the phytochemicals. Um, whether it's clean, you know, they're already small molecules, so there's not much to break them down into, but, but certainly they are acted upon by gut, gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, um, this may be taking a relatively inactive phytochemical and making it biologically more active. Um, so yeah, all that happens in the big nasty stew that's called the gut microbiome. Wonderful. Yeah, the, the prebiotic definition, those are, you are correct in the sense that they are those indigestible compounds that do feed the microflora. Um, and, and there are these, these polyphenols found in things like tea, coffee, um, cacao, that research has shown that these can act as prebiotics in feeding the microbiome. And those are also phytochemicals, right? With all of the benefits. And as you mentioned, we do have a broad sweep of research to support those for overall health, which is really interesting. And, um, and so fruits, vegetables, herbs, like what other sources of polyphenols would you say are some of the best to consume? Well, I mean, I think you've, I think you've hit it. Fruits, vegetables, and herbs, right? I mean, yeah. what else, what, what else is there? Um, I'm not trying to, not trying to be facetious, of course, tea and coffee, but they're, they're from leaves and beans. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I mean, the, the tea is a great example. So uh, um, ECGC, uh, epicatic, epicatic and gallo, that compound. Uh, I was going to be is, impressed if you could get that because I've never well, had to spit that out. I've just well, always abbreviated. <laughs> well, it's epigallo, catech, and gallate, I think. Um, okay. But but yeah, so that's a that's a rather large phytochemical, and, and that does get broken down. Um, so so yeah, and it has and so it generate it generates a number of different biological activities, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you, you know, I mean, pick any of those categories, you, large categories you mentioned, and you, you know you can you can rattle off a, a variety of well-known phytochemicals that are present in them. So, you know, grapes, uh, resveratrol, people know all about that. We still don't know how good it is for you, what it does for you. Um, but, but you know, there, there are a lot of mechanistic studies now with that. Um, curcumin uh, comes from turmeric, which is a, a rhizome or a root, similar to a root or to an underground stem. Um, uh, glucomeringin comes from the leaves of, of the moringa tree, which is a vegetable tree that I have done a lot of work with also, in, in addition to broccoli, um, it, which actually brings up something that um, I'd like to like to mention, you know, I, I've been working on broccoli, as I said, for something like 27 years now, hardcore. <clears throat> there has been limited funding for that work. Um, there because sulforaphane is not a, a drug or a medicine, mm. and because no phytochemicals in and of themselves are, are medicines, uh, strictly speaking, drugs, um, the research money comes from very different places than the money for dr drug research. Yet we see these drug-like activities in them, right? And we talk about phytochemicals being um, extraordinarily helpful for um, prevention and for preventing chronic disease and for treating some conditions. So they act like a drug, but boo-hoo, there's no intellectual property for the pharmaceutical companies. So big pharma wants nothing to do with them other than to take these phytochemicals 
and try to re-engineer them and make them stronger, less toxic. You know, there's always a range between potent between activity and toxicity of anything, including water and salt. Um, so pharmaceutical companies, if they become interested in the activity of a phytochemical, they want to take it, change it, make it better, make it different somehow, and then have something patentable. Um, so, so at any rate, they're, they're, the, the, the money to do this research has been, um, has been very difficult to come by. Um, so I sort of lost my, my uh, focus here. I, I went off on a tangent about funding because I'm mad no, about it. That's but, good. I think it's really important to know. And it's also a good segue to start talking about broccoli and broccoli sprouts. And, um, you know, these have become very popular uh, in the health and wellness field, longevity, biohacking. Um, and you've been involved in several clinical trials looking at the benefits of sulforaphane, which is the compound that's found in broccoli sprouts. And I would love to kind of dive in there on, you know, what are the benefits of broccoli sprouts? And, you know, I get a lot of questions. Well, can I just eat broccoli and can I just eat kale or these other cruciferous vegetables and get the same benefit? So yeah, maybe if we could start with what is sulforaphane and what are the clinical uh, benefits found in research? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do that. Let, I remembered wh why I got off on that rant about funding though, because I had mentioned Moringa, a, a leafy, a leafy green tree vegetable. Um, and so I do want to make, we'll talk about broccoli as much as you want, I promise. But I do want to make the point that broccoli or any of the cruciferous vegetables really are temperate uh, temperate zone crops, right? They need they, they grow in areas where you have freezing in the winter. Um, they're not tropical crops. They don't thrive in the tropics. So uh, I, you know, I became interested in broccoli before I got my doctorate in international health and nutritional biochemistry in the School of Public Health. But as I got, you know, people make, fun of the need to get doctorates and all the work you do and so on. But one of the things that really um, I absorbed from that experience was the, 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 not only the food scarcity in, uh, and food inequality in this country, but some of the issues in feeding and, and, and just survival um, in the rest of the world. And primarily we're talking about the tropics. So um, I've been working on broccoli, just take, we'll talk about the details, but take my word for it. It's good for you. So eat your you broccoli. Believe, yeah, yeah. So if you believe that, which I hope you do, <clears throat> and you think about, well, what about, you know, the other 6 billion people? What about the rest of the, the, the tropical portions of the world? They don't have broccoli. It's not appropriate to grow it in those, country, in those areas, really. So what's there? that may have similar mode of action. And it turns out that a tree called Moringa oleifera, the horseradish tree, um, or the drumstick tree it's called by some, is very fast growing, very readily available in the tropics, doesn't survive freezing, so you can't grow it um, above Southern California, maybe Southern Texas and Florida. But it has the same sorts of phytochemicals and many of the same benefits. Um, I think I was intending to tie that issue of funding into Moringa because whereas there has been little funding for work on broccoli, since it's a, a crop that benefit that grows in rich countries like in, in Europe and the US, Australia, New Zealand, something like Moringa is much less uh, sort of pan global and, and available in the, in the temperate climates. And the funding to work on that, even though I think it's every bit as much of a rock star as broccoli, has been minimal, just totally mm -hmm. minimal. So, okay, back to broccoli and sulforaphane. Um, I, as I say, Paul Talley and, and my mentor uh, who hired me at Hopkins, he and Yushin Zhang had just discovered sulforaphane in 1992. Um, and at the time, 
Paul was a, a cancer biologist. He was interested in cancer prevention, which was very unpopular then. People didn't think you could prevent cancer, um, certainly not by dietary means. And um, we started immediately looking at the mechanisms by which sulforaphane worked on cultured cancer cells um, and, and, and other cells. And realized, uh, I, I say we, this of course was a team effort le led by Paul uh, early on and for many, many years. Um, so Paul realized that there was something in, in some foods and some so-called antioxidants that was, was important in, in making cells um, more resistant to the oxidative stresses of day-to-day -day life. So you and I are breathing, at least for the moment, we still are. While we, while we breathe, we generate um, oxygen radicals, ROS, reactive oxygen species. If you ran in that Boston Marathon that you uh, um, said you spoke at uh, a couple of weeks ago, you might have generated, you would have generated more reactive oxygen species than um, just standing talking to me or sitting talking to me. And you know your body needs to detoxify them, and you don't want too many of them. You obviously need to achieve a balance. I won't talk to you about exercise physiology again. That's your that's your field, and we all need to exercise. But when we do, um, and even when we don't, we need to be neutralizing the reactive oxygen species. We also need to have some innate mechanism for damping down inflammation that is bound to occur in you know, our joints, our brains, our guts, all over the body, and, and, and on and on. There are, of course, many biochemical pathways we could talk about, but those two in particular are, it turns out, super targets for sulforaphane from broccoli. And um, it took many years, and it took a really concerted effort between scientists, uh, our group at Hopkins, uh, other groups at Hopkins, Tom Kensler, uh, who's uh, a toxicologist, uh, Masi Yamamoto in Japan, um, and a number of other groups around the, the world took all of that effort over 10, 10 or so years to go from, oh yeah, compounds like sulforaphane uh, upregulate the antioxidant response to figuring out how they actually did it. And so in conjunction with our work on sulforaphane primarily was this development of knowledge of how it works and by which mechanisms and, and the primary mechanism, I would say the, the mechanism that most of us are excited about and talk about most is the NRF2 pathway called NERF2 by some people, but this is we'll have to get a little technical here, but this is a nuclear transcription factor. So it's a molecule that's hanging out in the cytoplasm of a cell. And when sulforaphane or a similar molecule comes into the cell, it causes a change in conformation um, that allows this transcription factor to go to the nucleus where it sits on DNA and it regulates the transcription of a bunch of proteins, most of them enzymes. And those enzymes are then, we, we call it upregulated. And there's a whole suite of enzymes that's coordinately upregulated that's responsible for the antioxidant or, and cellular detoxication response. Likewise, there's a, there's a depression or, or, or uh, it's not a downregulation, but a reduction in the inflammatory response and there's a whole cascade of other responses that are caused by sulforaphane. But this NRF2 antioxidant detoxification response is probably the primary. I, I, th I think it's fair to say, at least for now, based on what we know, that it's the primary one. Um, so, you know, you, and you asked about how that translates to the clinic. Um, 20, Five years ago, when we really started looking hard at this, 
I developed broccoli sprouts as a, as a better source of sulforaphane. And it, it's actually the precursor to sulforaphane. We'll come back to that. But um, so yeah, broccoli is good for you. Broccoli sprouts arguably are even better for you. And I make broccoli sprouts in my kitchen all the time. I make various sprouts all the time because um, it's an awesome way to, to eat, frankly. Um, and if you're looking for another podcast guest, podcast guest, um, you should you should find um, Doug Evans. I can introduce you to him. He's he's the world sprout guy now, um, and he is a he is an awesome uh, person and an advocate for sprouts, especially and in including broccoli sprouts. But anyway, so mostly with broccoli sprouts or supplements that were made from extracts of broccoli sprouts. Um, we, we and others um, have been involved in a, um, a whole lot of clinical studies now, close to 100 of them now, um, most of them re relatively small. But in addition to looking at healthy people and just asking questions about pharmacokinetics and you know how fast it goes through you, how fast you can see it in the urine, what it does in, the, in a healthy body, so-called healthy body. None of us are perfectly healthy. But um, we've also used it looking at things at liver disease um, at, in people at risk for carcinogenesis, at people with frank cancer. There's a paper coming out on breast cancer in the next few days, actually, and sulforaphane. Um, metabolic disorders, diabetes, autism, schizophrenia, H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, which causes ulcers and, and um, uh, can cause stomach cancer, asthma, COPD, uh, cardiovascular disease, Parkinson's, erythema or sunburn. This is one that's ongoing now. Oh, actually, we've got a number of studies in uh, looking at that. Um, just skin aging, just normal skin aging, um, which is something that, uh, you know, the cosmetic companies, of course, have uh, make gazillions on, um, but uh, there's some efficacy, we, we, it appears, of sulforaphane and just normal aging of skin. More recently, um, and this has not been subject to a, a, a clinical, a proper clinical study, but animal and cell culture studies, COVID-19 and seasonal coronavirus. Um, right. This is work from friends at Hopkins that was just published a few, couple of months ago, I guess. Um, it's quite interesting and it's hopefully being translated to, to the clinic now. Um, Which kind of makes sense. I mean, when you talk about the in, in, anti-inflammatory benefits of broccoli sprouts and we know that COVID-19 is a it's an, an inflammatory cascade in the entire body essentially. Yeah absolutely um the other interesting part of the work they've done though this is uh Alvaro Ordonez and Lori Brando um at, at Johns Hopkins they're, they're pathologists and virologists they've also found that sulforaphane inhibits the replication of the coronavirus and inhibits infection. So they've done these studies with mice that they've infected. Yes, they haven't done it with humans, but um, so you mentioned the inflammatory component, which absolutely is the first thing that came to mind, but then it was sort of like a what, you know, a eureka moment when, <laughs> you know, they saw this, these effects, uh, direct effects. Um, also a lot of animal model work on, uh, things like arthritis, hypertension, atherosclerosis, and ischemia reperfusion injury, which is um, something that happens, for example, when you shut off the blood flow to a, an organ during surgery and then let it come back, um, you know, oxygenated blood come back, excuse me. So there really is this molecule, you know, we, I've certainly heard that the joke or the gotten the ribbing. Oh yeah, it does everything. You know, what, what else can it do? It, because of the central role it plays in, meta, in tweaking met, uh, metabolism, it does a lot of things. I mean, it, it acts on a lot of things. So yeah, so it's gone far, very far from our initial um, examination of it as something that may be helpful in preventing 
cancer. Um, and, I, and I think I said earlier, you know, Paul Talley, who, who died three years ago in his, in his mid nineties, um, Paul was a cancer biologist. And his idea was that solely that this could be something effective against cancer. And then when he started to realize the mechanisms by which it worked, um, he pushed us, pushed us all, the whole community to look at other chronic conditions, which might, you know, have similar um, edia, um, physiopathologies, sim similar uh, sort of starting points. Yeah, I, I think it's funny that it's, it's, we've been taught, I think, as consumers, you know, that when we treat certain conditions or have certain ailments, it's that we, we are we are treating in isolated systems, right? So we, we treat the liver and we treat the gut or we treat a headache with ibuprofen. And we tend to forget that all of these things in the body are actually connected. And a lot of the root causes of certain disease states are actually quite similar in inflammation, oxidative stress, metabolic dysfunction. And so when when you talk about you know, these pathways and upregulating, um, you know, the NRF2 pathways, it makes sense for somebody who can understand the why behind it and the mechanism behind it. But I think as individuals, just the lay public, you know, we've been taught that you treat individual systems. And I think we need to kind of move away from that a little bit. Not a little bit, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. So there, there are two books that I've read. Well, one that I've just finished recently and the other that I'm in the middle of that are that really speak to that and beautifully I think one is Metabolical by Robert Lustig uh, it's just it's been out for less than a year okay. um, and and he really takes a bead on um, big pharma big ag um, big food um, but that's you know his his thesis is yeah you know it's all about metabolism and you've got to get to the root of the problem uh, and then you will prevent simultaneously this whole constellation of chronic diseases that include cancer and many of the others that we've mentioned and that even includes so-called genetic diseases because just because you're genetically predisposed to get um, something nasty doesn't mean that you absolutely will and as nutrigenomics sure. and epigenetics play in there and you can change the expression of your genes yes yeah, exactly exactly which is a good segue to my second book recommendation yeah. and that's uh one that cara fitzgerald just published um and i forgot uh i forgot the title of it um um life i think is uh is in the title it's sitting on my nightstand but um but anyway also she she really stresses epigenetics and that is for those of your listeners who don't know you know you got dna everybody knows what dna does but duh it doesn't always get made available to be read um and so uh covering up parts of dna or coiling it up or blocking it with methyl groups um allows for very differential expression of, of genes. So, so for example, if you got a bad gene and we all have gotten bad genes, um, if, they're, if they're methylated and covered up and can't be transcribed to make the bad protein that causes the disease, I'm simplifying it a bit, but then you may never, you may never have, you may never get that condition. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, I don't think I, there's something I need to tell you about uh, sulforaphane that we didn't, that we didn't get to. I want to make sure we do. Um, first of all, broccoli is, is pretty much the only cruciferous vegetable that has a significant amount of sulforaphane. This is contrary to a lot of self-appointed talking heads in the nutrition space say, um, all crucifers don't have nutrition have sulforaphane. Um, however, all cruciferous vegetables, and there's something like five or 600 of them, uh, if you include all the minor ones in strange out of the way places in the world, um, all cruciferous vegetables do have, have isothiocyanates, which is the, the class of phytochemical that's very, structurally very, very similar 
to sulforaphane. They're all closely related. And pretty much all of them, never say all, but mo most of the vast majority of them have similar biological activities to sulforaphane, have interesting biological activities. There's non, there's overlap and there's non-overlap in the scope and spectrum of, of the, um, their activities. Um, but um, so that's one point. Never, never, please, Aaron, I don't know if you're uh, a myth uh, perpetuator, but please never tell anybody that all crucifers have sulforaphane from this point yeah. on. Okay. I'm, I'm team broccoli sprout, so I, and I am also team science, and as, as is the expert on here, I will continue to uh, con 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 continue the same recommendation based on your assurance, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so the, se the second thing is that I keep talking about sulforaphane. I think I mentioned glucosinolates, but what the, what the plant itself actually has, whether it be a broccoli, well, let's use broccoli as the example, is it has a compound called a glucosinolate, which is also a phytochemical, it's a small molecule, but it's biologically, it's not very active either for the plant or for hosts, for people or bacteria that might eat it. Um, you know, there are actually some demonstrated activities, but let's, let's say for all intents and purposes, it's an inactive compound. So what happens when you or a predator, well, you are a predator, when you eat the broccoli, you, you break open the cells and, and then this glucosinolate um, is released from a, from a bag, a sap, cell sap vacuole, it's called. So it's contained within the cytoplasm. It's released and it's allowed to interact with an enzyme called myrosinase, which is membrane bound in other parts of the cell. So everything is kept nice and apart when the plant is growing healthily. But if you wound it by chewing or, or penetrating it with a fungal hostoria or whatever, um, then you make mush and that mush quickly, it's a, it's a catal catalytic reaction and, and, it, and it balloons and you form sulforaphane or other isothiocyanates, which are yet smaller molecules and involves cleaving a glucose off the, the, the glucosinolate and a little bit of rearrangement. But then sulforaphane and all of the isothiocyanates are highly reactive and biologically active. And so it's a, it's a cool system. There are a few other systems like it in the plant world. Um, uh, there's one in olives with uh, formation of things like uh, uh, luripin. Um, there's a system like it in the onion family, chives and onion and leek. Um, garlic as well, right? The garlic, yep. We have a precursor and then, you know, upon wounding or chewing it, it, it changes into something biologically active. And when you say uh, biologically active, you're saying that, you know, when you chop these vegetables or chew them, the benefits actually are enhanced, correct? So the, the benefit would be chopping your broccoli, chewing it properly, allowing for that enzymatic activity to happen. We want that, correct? Yeah, yes, but you're, you're walking on a bit of a slippery slope there because, you know, if you, if, if you, I mean, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing too much probably, but if you take, you know, a floret, a big hunk of broccoli and just suck it down, pretend it's a big pill and just gulp it down, you know, your stomach is going to smash it up, right? And, and, and the bacteria in your gut are going to take care of it. So it's, it's going to be pretty much, it's going to be pretty badly wounded by the time it uh, gets through the, your digestive tract. So, um, so yes, you, if you pre-masticate it, if you chop it up first, um, you, you will start that activity, which plays into the whole world's desire to have smoothies be a new food group, you know, so yeah. you can make, you can make a broccoli smoothie and yes, you start the reaction. Um, but it, it, it's, uh, frankly, you know, I, I I, I think it really doesn't matter too much what form you get okay. format you get it in. Can and, you, you know, like if the food is frozen, like let's say the broccoli's frozen or the onions are frozen, 
well, let's, let's just talk about broccoli and yep. specifically mm -hmm. if, if broccoli is frozen, if it's pre-chopped and then put in the bag and then you buy it and you cook it, are you still getting a decent amount of these benefits or what is the best way to, to consume this is sprouts number one, then maybe like number two would be fresh broccoli and then third would be frozen. Like how would you direct consumers to try to achieve getting these benefits? Um, I, I wouldn't want to go too far into the weeds because the risk there is, I will give you my answer, but the risk there is sort of diverting the conversation away from just eat a bunch of red vegetables, folks, you know, mm -hmm. just eat a bunch of fruits and vegetables or eat a diet that's rich in plants or plant forward and just vary them. Um, you know, the varying them, I think is really important the eating a variety. And I would, you know, b because you're, you're, you're sort of spreading the, it's like playing the stock market. You're spreading the wealth across a lot of different beneficial phytochemicals. So yes, in terms of knowingly and willfully delivering the biggest load of sulforaphane to your system, uh, yes, broccoli sprouts are number one. Well, you, you could argue that dietary supplements that are well-made and that are rich in sulforaphane or rich in glucoraphanin because there are few or no supplements that are rich in sulforaphane because it's unstable and it doesn't last in formulation. So there are some good supplements and for people that don't, um, that don't like broccoli, but really want to have some sulforaphane. Yeah. I, I think, I think so. Uh, I think supplements are, are a good strategy. And as we get older, um, we tend to eat less and exercise less. And, you know, it's hard to get a, a large variety of fruits and vegetables. And as we get older, and I'm keenly aware of this, um, you know, we are subject to, we probably need more and more antioxidant protection um, and anti-inflammatory protection. So I'm, 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 I used to be dead set against supplements because I thought there was no need for them, but I, but I think they certainly have their place. Uh, so I guess supplements would be at the top of the list, but then fresh broccoli sprouts, um, fresh broccoli, the, the, veg, the conventional vegetable. Um, I, then it's a toss up, I think, between cooked, lightly cooked microwave broccoli and frozen broccoli. And then broccoli, the way they used to make it in grade school cafeterias, um, where they cooked it for 10 hours, a pot of boiling water is at the bottom of the list. Because what happens there is all the pot liquor or all the juice at the bottom of the pot contains all the glucosinolates. Mm. And so unless you drink that, which tastes pretty skunky, you're, you're not, you know, you'll get the benefit of the fiber, but you won't get the benefit of the phytochemicals. So, but, you know, once we've had this conversation about what's the best form, then we should also have the conversation about variability person to person. Mm -hmm. And there is huge variability person to person in, in, in bioavailability of glucosinolates and uh, glucoraphanin and sulforaphane. And, you know, that, that has led to almost a cottage industry of bloggers and, and um, podcasters, you know, spending hours talking about the best way to do your, to get your sulforaphane, to, to cook your broccoli. And I get all sorts of questions about, you know, should I, can I freeze broccoli sprouts and then then cook them and how long do I have to cook them? And if I make tea out of them, do I have to have a top on the vessel or not? You know, my, my sort of, my answer to them is typically, um, I, I try to give a serious answer, but the bottom line is just eat more fruits and vegetables and don't worry about this stuff so much. Um, and, and also until we're at a point in personalized medicine, which probably won't ripple down to the vast majority of the populace, but if we reach a point where we can put a, put a, a label on each of us as to, you know, 
how, how much myrosinase activities in our gut microflora, how good a sulforaphane met, uh, metabolizer are we, et cetera, then you know, maybe it's worth talking about these different ways of cooking and making it available. But the bottom line is, you know, we all have different eye color, skin color, hair color, weight, you know, I won't, I won't pick gender because that's just, there are very few choices there, but you know, there's shades of gray in everything that makes us individuals. And that includes our gut microbiomes. Um, and so the, the, one of the tough things about that is, you know, we, we've done studies, we and others have done studies where we've looked at glucosinolate bioavailability, glucoraphanin bioavailability, sulforaphane bioavailability in individuals over time. Same people, multiple days, and it changes in a way that we don't really understand. And the best clue we have, we, we've or not, not the best clue, but one clue that we have is that there seems to be a circadian rhythmicity to bioavailability. Sure. Well, and then we published a little bit on that. Um, so that might speak to the circadian rhythm of gut microbiome activity. You know, they, do they act, do they, are they more active at night when you're asleep or during the day when you're sloshing around? You probably have some opinions on that, but, but, you know, the bottom line is that this bioavailability question is so complicated by who you are, what you, who your gut microflora are, um, and then a whole bunch of unknowns that, yes, we want to understand someday, but we, we don't now. Sure. And I, I actually, I appreciate that. I think most consumers want us, but, and, you know, as a dietitian, my client, how much should I eat? How much of this? How much of that? Exactly how many servings? And yeah. of course, there is some, you know, direction that I can give them and, you know, macronutrients, micronutrients, whatnot, especially based on testing. But it is true that, you know, we're looking for this specific of, you know, how do I do this to get X, Y, and Z? And it's not always that simple. It's more often not that simple when it comes to nutrition and, um, things like these compounds that are yes, beneficial, but, you know, we're trying to turn it into almost like a medicine, which food is medicine, but it's not as easy as here's 10 milligrams of ibuprofen, take it every day. And, you know, you'll be fine, which we know with drugs, even there's the inter individuality and metabolism and gut microbiome breaking it down. So I actually appreciate your response. And I think it might hopefully bring some ease to people who are trying to look for these, um, you know, cutting edge recommendations when in reality, the bottom line is, is just eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. I would recommend eating broccoli. It seems like you would as well. And that is a great way to improve your health and, you know, improve things like inflammation, brain health, gut health, and so forth. Yep. Yep. I, I mean, you know, I didn't, we didn't even mention, so we mentioned different amounts of myrosinase um, in the gut bacteria in the case of broccoli. But, you know, there are also person to person differences just in factors that, that influence the way these compounds are absorbed, metabolized, excreted, um, just because we are who we are. We're all, we're all different. We also eat differently. And so the food context in which you take these things in makes a huge difference. We know that. Um, so unless you eat exactly the same diet every day, um, you know, you, you can't expect to get the same bioavailability of compounds like this um, reproducibly. And we've, again, we've shown this in small clinical studies. Excellent. And if you, are you comfortable sharing any specific supplements that you would recommend based on reputable brands if people are interested? Um, I'm comfortable. Uh, I'm comfortable sharing it. Yeah. But this, this, this really speaks to the, the gluc glucoraphanin based supplements. Um, yeah. So full disclosure, um, I co-founded a company called Brassica Protection Products back in the mid nineties with Paul Talley. Um, we both backed away from it. 
his um, his son uh, is the CEO of the company, and I'm now consulting for them, although I'm not an owner in any way. Um, and they make they make the best ingredient. So the, so they make an ingredient called Trubrock, which is I think it's 13% glucoraphanin by weight. It's a freeze dried uh, uh, or sorry, a spray dried powder that is used, I mentioned it because my, my consulting for them has led me to inspect the analyticals for theirs and a lot of other companies. So they sell to a lot of the best um, supplement companies who then formulate it. Some of them just formulate it in, in gel caps by itself and give it, a, give it a, you know, a trade name. Others combine it with, with other phytochemicals. Um, I, I know for a fact that Brassica Protection Products tries not to sell to fly-by-night cruddy supplement makers, um, but I know that some of the best ones that they sell to are, for example, Thorn. Um, mm -hmm. Thorn's a big, a big and reputable company. They make something called um, Crucera SGS that is loaded with glucoraphanin. Um, Nutramax uh, is a company that makes something called Abmacol, which um, also is highly reputable. Um, there's a company called um, Oncoplex. Um, that make, is that the company name? Yeah, uh, no, Zymogen makes, makes a compound called um, Oncoplex, I believe, which also is very good. And there are a number of others, I can't remember them all, but um, on Brassica Protection Products website, since they don't sell to consumers, um, they, it's business to business. They have a list of their uh, of the supplements that that contain their product on their oh, website. Good. I can okay. give you a link to that. Yeah, I can link it okay. in the show notes. That's excellent. Um, okay. And, and then you know, I, sorry, go ahead. Well, well, I know that for example, because I've visited them and seen their labs, I know at least those companies have are highly reputable, and I wouldn't. Well, I do buy some other supplements like Quercetin from from them. Uh, and glucosamine for our pets from, from Nutramax. Um, so I, I'm very comfortable buying other things from them too, even though I, I haven't done the, the, you know, degree of personal test of, um, of, of lab testing on their products. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So things to look for in terms of like buying broccoli sprouts and supplements, I would imagine you'd want to care about organic and uh, making sure that they're not heavily sprayed with pesticides, things like that. But it's good to know, um, you know, from your perspective of kind of what those companies are, and I can direct people to that website for more information. Uh, that would be great. And, and in terms of broccoli sprouts, I, 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 I am going to make some people angry with me by saying this probably, but I would be very careful buying them from grocery stores and, and, the reason for that is they get they get skanky looking so fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, the quality their quality may be great when they come in the door, but it's really up to the individual produce managers to rogue out the the the, the, the stuff that's going bad. And sprouts do go bad quickly. They they rot. You know, they get slimy. I would encourage everybody to grow your grow their own sprouts. Um, it's not that hard. So, it's not that hard. Some of them are really easy to grow and you can always have fresh, fresh vegetables on your table. Um, they're delicious. And if you don't think they're delicious, you can put them in a smoothie and camouflage them. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, again, my friend Doug Evans, who wrote the Sprout book is a huge um, uh, advocate for, for doing that. And I, I'm, I'm helping him trying to popularize home sprouting again. Mm -hmm because um, it's, so, it's so bloody easy and it really doesn't take time. It, so a, anyway, I, I, would, I would definitely encourage home sprouting um, and just eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, a variety of plants. Um, yes, you get a few phytochemicals laundered through meat if you eat, um, if, you, if you do practice some carnivory because a lot of the, animals you eat all of the animals you eat really or you know seafood eats plants um 
I, I really don't eat meat myself, um, but uh, I, I certainly do eat uh, bivalves, oysters and mussels and, and, and fish. Um, and, you know, there, the, there's the omega-3 fatty acid issue that um, we didn't talk about, but a lot of seafood is rich in that. And, and you certainly need that for brain development and brain health. Oh, my listeners have heard me drill in omega-3s um, plenty of times. So I'm sure they, <laughs> they can go back and listen to any episode, but I'm glad you brought that up. That's, that's really important. Yeah. Um, now, is there anything else that you wanted to add that you would want consumers to know? Um, anything that you're really passionate about or working on right now that's really important to you? Um, I, well, I, I would say, I think we covered my, my sort of passionate take home about eating a variety of fruits and vegetables and don't worry about the details that much. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate you're not asking me what's your, you know, what's your favorite. If you could, you know, if you're on a desert island and only could have one one fruit or vegetable, what would it be? Or what's your favorite superfood? Because although, although I've used the term a few times in my life myself, I don't like the word superfood. I don't because either. Because it, it just diverts attention from the fact that we need to have a varied diet rich in fruits and vegetables. It's been said so many times. But looking for these expensive, sometimes weird superfoods is, I don't think, helpful to the message for the masses. Um, I, I'm, I, I love moringa, and it's rather expensive compared to locally grown vegetables. And I love, you know, strange tropical fruits and vegetables as much as anybody. But uh, I also don't make a steady diet of them uh, because it's not as sustainable and, and, and on and on. So thank you for not asking me those questions because I would have had to give a painful answer. My, que <laughs> my, my ending question for every guest is what is your favorite childhood memory with food? Um, string beans. Okay. Yeah string beans because well and, well and corn string beans because my parents forced me to eat a bowl of string beans that i was not eating and i told them i'd throw up and they forced me to and then i threw up and <laughs> you know um and i from then on i've not been that fond of string beans um sweet corn uh, is another one because i had braces for a time and the corn would always get caught in my braces. And so I'd be the one sitting at the table, cutting it off the cob. Anyway. My, my boyfriend does that. He cuts it off the cob and he doesn't have braces. And I'm like, how can you do that? I feel like the, the main experience of eating corn is just biting into that and then getting all the stuff in your teeth. But, you know, he says, I don't like it getting stuck in my teeth. <laughs> well, I, can, I sort of agree with him. Plus, you know, when I was a when I was a kid, I didn't have a mustache, but um, <laughs> now I do. So it's like a it's like a brush on the butter, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Those it's like are a sponge wonderful. That absorbs <laughs> butter up into your <laughs> very moisturizing, I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah. so, you smell like awesome. butter for the next day. <laughs> Not the worst thing, I guess, depending on how much you like butter. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Fahey. This has been um, an incredibly informative um, episode, and I will be sure to direct listeners to your website so they can take a look at your work and all the different podcasts and ways that you've continued to share your, you know, decades of research and in, you know, expertise with people. And, and that's incredible. So thank you for the work that you're doing and that you've done. And uh, thank you for taking the time out of your um, precious schedule to to come on today. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure the listeners do as well. Well, um, it was my pleasure. I, as I say, I, I enjoy getting the word out best I can. And it's always helpful to do it with someone like yourself, who is a professional at getting the word out. Thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you, Jed. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too.